Welcome to the Bloomington Rotary Club's weekly celebration of service for March 30th, 2021. I'm your current president, Ashley Wesley. Thank you for being here. Natalie, please show the flag graphic for 15 seconds of respectful silence. We ask that you remain on mute and take this time to personally reflect. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Raj Dawi, who will be offering our reflection. Raj? You're muted, Raj. Good morning. Well, I received, like most of you, an email earlier in March, remind the members that there are a few opening for the reflection. Well, duty as Rotarian, I went ahead and put my name there without me knowing what am I going to talk about. I was reading a book about history of medicine called The Invention of Medicine, goes back 500 years before BC. And I thought it would be ideal if I share with you history of the Hippocratic Oath. The more I read about it, the more it is littered with mythology, with fiction, with poor translation, and essentially part of it, social is not acceptable in our society today. So I backed off. I thought that required another day. My second attempt happened, I was watching the visit of Pope Francis to Southern Iraq. To be exactly, he was visiting the residual city of Ur, which many of you hopefully was able to watch the trip of the Pope where this is a first world known human society in history of mankind about five to 6,000 years ago. Well, that happened to be my neighborhood where I was born. I was born 15, 20 miles south of Ur, and Ur used to be a historical site for all of us to go and have a school picnics. So I thought, well, I was in March birth, and I looked at it March 3rd, 1942. And then it dawned on me further, what did this month of March do to shape me who I am? And I would like to share with you a few pointers that created what you know now to do, uh, to be me. Mm -hmm. In addition to my birthplace, I went to like anybody else through high school. My very interest at that time is to be an architect, my favorite things in life. And boy, did I accept, was accepted as a pre-admission student and I was delighted until March of that year. I came home, my late dad, who is a chain smoker, having emphysema, followed by complication, heart failure, et cetera, et cetera. And I had to call a cab because he has an attack, take him to his family doctor. And his moment of confusion, whether he really meant it or not, he says, son, I have too many of you, too many children, but when I needed the most, none of you could help. Man, that was a dagger in the heart of this kid of 18 years old. Next day, after we admitted him to the hospital, he got better. Next day, went to the architect school, he drew my folder from them, take the bus, go to the medical school laid my file on them. They said, no way, we are full, we have a waiting list. I said, I don't mind, put me on the waiting list. 
And boy, I didn't, did I harass them. I go every single day, take the bus, knock the door on the registrar office. And finally, after two weeks, I think the registrar himself noticed me coming every day. He said, son, can I help you? I said, yes, I need to be in medical school. He said, but we are full. And I said, but I still want to be there. And my folder with you, all my recommendation, my grade, acceptable to you. He said, well, let me look at it again, come tomorrow. I came tomorrow, he gave me the AOK to enter medical. Well, small history a little bit here, and excuse me, actually, if I'm going to take a little time. Uh, medical school established in Baghdad in 1932, one of the good acts of the British occupation of what used to be called Mesopotamia, which they occupied after the First World War and laid ground there, and they didn't want to go anywhere. They want to love Iraq. There is something good in it. We didn't know what is it until the time showed up, the black oil there. But in any case, their act was establishing a medical school connected straight to the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Their curriculum all the same. And why I tell this story, because what will follow will be dependent on what I'm saying now. Their exam all in essay form. Multiple choice question is unknown, absolutely unknown until my final year of graduation, the medical school announced that this year, your final exam going to be multiple choice questions. Are you kidding? We never had anything like that. So we struggle with that. Yeah, well, there are very few flyers we have, we looked at them, not enough to sit and pass exam. It happened to be, at that time, the days of the past, there is an institution in Baghdad called the American okay. Friend of the Middle East. Those folks, they give us a place to go and hang out. Our afternoon, they open, they offer coffee, tea, and my goodness, Life Magazine, Newsweek, and they add to it all brochure from different universities and colleges in the United States. So we entertain ourselves and they add to it movie in the afternoon. Short story, they said, if you take our exam, we offer it in multi-choice question and you check yourself before you take your own exam. Sound fair. So me and five of my friends, we sat, took the multiple choice question in March 1st. And that is where the month of March kick on. Four weeks later, I was notified, I passed. A week later, my mailbox was full, literally. I got a total of 45 to 50 letter from different a training program in the US. They asking me either to apply or some of them incorporate application form with it. What happened here in 1965-66, we have massive shortage of physician in the United States, majority of them being drafted to the Vietnam War. And there are so many vacancies, they couldn't fill it up. And when they got hold of my name, as I am passing the qualifying test, well, they jump at it. Well, that is March. So the process evolved. I came to the United States. I was training in a hospital just outside DC but really a uh, part of the University of Maryland. Three years later in March, again, I was doing a procedure required to have an X-ray. So we called the X-ray tech to come, which usually she come by herself. 
But this time she brought a younger person with her and she said, this is Darlene, I would like you to meet. She is going to be helping me to x-ray you. Great, we did the x-ray, the poor Darlene was nervous, shaky, first time in the operating room through surgeons and what have you. Anyhow, make the story short, I run into Darlene again through the hallway, through the x-ray department, everywhere, and I got to ask her for a cup of coffee. She accepted. Then I asked her if she'd go out with me. She said, no, I live at home. You have to come to our house first. Well, my goodness, her house in Andrews Air Force, and the dad is a full colonel. I have to dress up well, be presentable. Anyhow, it ended with a meal, spaghetti and meatball, big deal. And the story goes, longer. Darlene turned out to be my wife. Uh, we are 51 years together now. My last day of March is March 31, 2015. That is where I officially closed my private practice office in Bloomington. And that is where the process of volunteering medicine started. So if you look at my few points I gave you guys, you have to agree, March is a good friend of mine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Raj. <laughs> and if you are interested in signing up to offer your own reflection, we'd love to hear from you. So just like Raj, you'll be seeing that fourth quarter reflection come out soon. So take the spot and tell us more about you. Okay, we have just a few guests with us today. Randy Wheeler is joining us again. Thank you for joining us, Randy. And Catherine Swanson, sister of Rotarian Tina Swanson is with us once again. Welcome back. Thanks to our producers, Natalie Blaze. Michael Shermis, Sally Gaskell, and Aaron Davis for helping us keep this ship running. And roundabout reporter for this week is Susie Graham. Thank you for keeping us reported. We love it. We have quite a few birthdays, lots of April babies here. John Zodi, March 31st. Steve Moberly, April 1st. Sandy Keller, April 1st. Sarah Laughlin, April 2nd. Tina Peterson, April 3rd. And Lynn Schwartzberg, April 4th. Happy birthday to everyone. And membership anniversaries. Becky Jesmer is one year. Monica Croner, 31 years. Tina Swanson, 32 years. Charlotte Zitlow, 33 years. And Jerry Pajak, 15 years. Thank you so much for being a part of the Rotary family. That's quite an impressive list of years there. One of our Rotarians was in the news. Scott Shackelford was interviewed in IU Alumni Magazine on the topic of the Internet of Things. Very interesting interview that covers topics in his book of almost the same name. District grant applications are due next Monday, April 5th. So be sure to get your applications in if you're sponsoring a proposal for the district grant. Please complete the application and send to Von Welch. His information will be in the roundabout. And we've received several so far, so keep submitting and be sure to get those in before the end of the day on April 5th so that we can review them. Register for the district conference. It's coming up on April 17th. It's online, it's free, it's from 10 to two. It'll be really engaging and fun. And the club with the highest percentage attendance will be entered into a uh, raffle, I guess you could say, to receive $1,000 of service project dollars. So please sign up to attend uh, just a few hours on April 17th. You'll get to engage with district level speakers and hear more about what's happening with Rotary. And we might get some more service project money out of it. So we'd love to have you join. And the, the link to sign up, you should have received an email from the district with your personalized um, registration link there. So if you need any support, just reach out to Natalie or myself. And a quick update on Randy Bridges' Celebration of Life arrangements. On Saturday, May 22nd, there will be an interment service at Trinity Episcopal Church at 1130. 
and there will be a gathering at Nick's English Pub upstairs at 12.30. Rotarians and friends are welcomed and invited to attend by Vivian, and we will share a reminder as we get closer to the date. All right, we, I would love to jump right into our speaker, but I wanna leave just a moment or two for any happy dollars. Does anyone have a happy dollar to share? I have a happy dollar. You, some of you may remember that a couple of uh, weeks ago, I talked about the frog that was being kept by the volunteer coordinator at uh, Community Kitchen. I'm told she has emerged. She is outdoors and she seems to have laid eggs. So that's a happy ending to that. And uh, I will be submitting happy dollars. Thanks, Martha. Michael? Yeah, I, um, as an event planner, when you get one all ready uh, to go, um, there's a moment of uh, definite happiness. Um, we're uh, doing, uh, for the City of Bloomington for the Council for Community Accessibility is doing an event called Breaking Down the Barriers. Um, it, it can't do what we normally do, um, which is to go out and thank accessible business. This year, we are going to hold a virtual event about <laughs> virtual events, as in specifically, how do you make them more accessible? We will have people who are uh, blind and deaf and traumatic brain injuries and other uh, others there to uh, talk together about ways that you can make your virtual event. So it may be irrelevant to uh, 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 not that many here, but somebody here may go, oh, that's a great event. If so, give me an email and I will I'll be happy to set you up with registration. So, thanks. Thanks, Michael. I give $10 in honor of my good friend, Lynn Coyne. Lynn Coyne is my first friend in Bloomington in the early 70s. And what is special about it is he was one of two families that stood beside me when I pledged the allegiance to the United States of America during my citizenship. Awesome. All right, last call for happy dollars. I'll just jump in and say that I'm extremely happy to be the other side of a big project since uh, Michael was talking about a project and this is a, uh, a conference that I ran this past weekend online about innovation in art song, which is a really beautiful genre uh, in classical music. And so if you wanna check it out, I've just put the put the link and I'm just uh, very grateful to be the other side <laughs> of a complex project. Wonderful, thanks a lot. Jim Sims. Thank you. Um, I'd like to donate $30 to Happy Dollars for today. Um, and if Natalie can just bill me for that, I'd appreciate that rather than going to the link. Um, but the reason for that is, and I've shared it with many um, or people in my breakout room. But I think many of you know that after my daughter passed, we established a uh, nursing scholarship fund in her honor. And I was, she received news yesterday that we have about $30,000 in that account, um, almost five weeks maybe. Um, so I'd like to give a dollar for every thousand that has been donated or contributed so far. So thank you and don't forget to bill me, Natalie. Thank you. Wonderful news, Jim. Okay, if that's all, I would like to introduce Lynn Schwartzberg, who will be introducing our speaker today. Thank you so much. Um, first, I apologize. I, I'm not typically a movie star, but I face south and my, my glasses are tinted because of the sun. Um, I am delighted to introduce Lynn Coyne. Obviously, a lot of you already know Lynn, um, but what a treat to have you here today. Lynn is a trustee for the Bloomington campus of Ivy Tech Community College. His service there is a continuation of a lifetime of engagement in education and economic development. You might remember um, that he co-chaired the Yes for MCCSC School Funding Referendum Committee all the way back in 2016. He served as president and CEO of the Bloomington Economic Development Corporation and assistant vice president for real estate, economic development and associate counsel for Indiana University. Uh, 
Lynn has been active in community organizations, who's the chair of the IU Health Bloomington Hospital Board of Directors during the planning for the new regional academic health center, which we're about to see come to life, um, and now serves on the South Central Regional Board for IU Health. There's so much more that I can say about Lynn, but I would love for us to turn the, the floor so that we can hear all of the wonderful updates about Ivy Tech that he has to bring. Welcome, Lynn. Where's Lynn? Where's Lynn? Lynn, you're muted. There we go. Okay. So, hi there. <laughs> Thanks for the great introduction. It's it's super to see all. Raj, it's great to see you and everybody. Uh, you have a wonderful club. You always have. It's just super. And so I'll, I'll try to get through this. Susie Graham's going to run the slides. This is, uh, thank you, Susie. So it's a two-person show here. Uh, and so... The, let me just talk a little bit about the point of this is that what, I, what I'd really like to do, I am, I am not an employee of Ivy Tech. I am a volunteer. And uh, over the last, oh my gosh, 10, 15 years, whatever, I've become passionate about Ivy Tech and its mission because of all the people I've seen it help and the great things they do. So I want to talk a little bit about that and how Ivy Tech brings value to Monroe County, Bloomington, Monroe County. Because I, as I go around, I, a lot of people don't understand just what Ivy Tech, Tech does. It's like on the west side somewhere. It's, it's over there. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about so I can, uh, maybe you can help some people along the way. So I'd like you to be thinking about someone, whether it's a, a family member, a neighbor, a coworker, or whatever, that, that doesn't like their job or maybe doesn't have a job. They want to skill up. They want to change. They want to do something different. Uh, nowadays, think about some young person graduating from high school and, you know, uh, boy, it's tough to get into college. Some of them, frankly, didn't do well last year. And I talked to someone the other day that they think their senior may not graduate. Um, the, the, these kind of people, uh, people need, need some sort of change or some upgrading their skills are the kind of people I'd like you to keep in mind as we go through this, this program today. Lynn, I'm sorry, before you go on, can everyone see the slides? Yeah, and if you click on slideshow at the very top, it'll it'll give the presentation look. Well, I can't get to it because the, the, the hosting bar is blocking that and I can't, I was you trying can, to grab that. And you can move the hosting bar, you can grab it and move it. Oh, okay, hang on, hang on everybody. Oh, Alain, you just rock. <laughs> just trying to help you. There we go. Yay, thank you so much. Then, okay. Okay, and Lynn, you're good to go. Voila, it looks great. All right, so uh, I think you all do understand that Ivy Tech Community College is a statewide college, um, 18 campuses around the state. Overall, they have about 90,000 students either on campus or online because of the pandemic. But besides that, there are another 60,000 plus students who are doing high school dual credit. And I'll, I'll talk a lot about that in a minute. Um, next slide, Susie. Now, I should say, so we serve these eight counties, right? Monroe and seven other counties through the Bloomington campus, but there are also, uh, I think we have four additional instructional, I think four of them, additional instructional sites throughout this area. There's one in Bedford, et cetera where classes are actually delivered. So uh, like I started to say, you know, I started my tenure as a campus trustee for Ivy Tech about six years ago. And I, I thought I knew what they did. You know, you go over there and you're trained to get a job, something like that. And so through my tenure with economic development and also as a trustee, I've learned it's just way deeper than that. Um, Ivy Tech uh, brings a great deal to the community. Um, you know, we'll get into that, but it's critically important to our employers. You know, your Catalans, your Cooks, your Boston Scientific, your Crane, Crane employers, the contractors that support Crane, uh, startups, it helps startups. 
Uh, it does so much. And we partner with, you know, our partner at Indiana University and other public universities around the state. So what it's really about, what we're trying to do is give everyone in the state an opportunity to get the skills and training they need to live a fulfilling life, get a well-paying job, be able to move themselves forward in society. That's really the ultimate mission behind all this. So, you know, whether it's a recent high school graduate and, or not, or whatever, the person who maybe was unemployed by the pandemic, uh, needs a job, th they're able to get this kind of thing close to home and it's highly affordable. Uh, we're gonna talk about the supportive learning environment that Ivy Tech offers. And we'll go through all that here as we go on. So let's talk about how we help uh, a student that shows up. Now this is, when I say student, this could be a 70 year old, it could be an 18 year old, it could be a 50 year old. It could be someone in an academic course, it could be someone in a job training course. So it, this is the whole student uh, body that we're talking about. So one, they get academic tutoring and it's free, okay? so. Sometimes we'll get a student uh, who hasn't done well in high school. They weren't interested, they didn't do well, they're out a little bit. They now realize how important it is and they wanna get back in and they wanna get their training, they wanna get their education. We give them academic tutoring. So maybe you have a high school student who's not quite ready for college. They're, they need the math and the writing that's so tough usually for a lot of them. They can take it at Ivy Tech, we'll help them get through that and learn it. Life coaching, this has become critical, particularly in the pandemic. By life coaching, we have, we'll help them with their day-to-day -day problems that, so that they're able to come to class, they're able to take that class on and attend. You know, whether that's dealing with childcare, dealing with life issues, medical issues, whatever it is, we'll try to help them through that. Then, then with the career coaching, when they come to us, wherever they are, whatever they're doing, how does that connect to a career? What does that mean? And help teach them and talk them through where they're going, and how they get to that end. And we do that through proactive advising. Now, what that means is, is we don't wait for a student to come and knock on some advisor's door. When a student enrolls at Ivy Tech, we knock on their door and we say, hey, we want to talk to you about what your plans are what you should be doing, what we think you're doing, how's it going? Do we need to do something different? Do we need to help you? Do you have a problem? And so it's very proactive. And then of course, we, we have financial advising where we help them with the obvious, which is financing their education, but also with their own budgeting issues. You know, uh, Sometimes that's a real problem for them to help them stay on as a student. If we have to, we'll do that. And many of our students are interested in student life, getting to know other students. And we have a very robust student organization and student groups that gather and share information across all the ages. So the, the support network for someone walking into Ivy Tech is enormous. And it's actually the critical basis for their success, for keeping them in, keeping them on track for their education. What's the next slide there, Susie? You. Well, maybe it'll work. So about our faculty. Okay, so who teaches out there? I mean, who are these people? All right. So the faculty, uh, most, well, they'll have a master's degree, minimum of a master's degree, or industry-related training that would be the equivalent. And you'll see what that means in that. I talk about the trades. Um, so there, and many of them do have their PhDs. Uh, I show you this slide because uh, these three, uh, Larry Swafford, this, uh, Professor Cody, and uh, Josh Barrington, they are they earn statewide honors. Our campus routinely gets statewide honors for its faculty. Their focus is on student success. Uh, Unlike Indiana University, we're not a teaching and research institution. Ivy Tech doesn't do that. What they, their mission is to educate students. And that's foremost in, in our mind when the student walks in the door. Is when they walk in, we want them to be a success in that class, in life, and in their entire academic career. 
go on to the next one here. I'm trying then. I'm having <laughs> my keyboard isn't responding. Next. There we go. I'm sorry about that. It's okay, we'll figure it out. <laughs> now, for example, okay. We have a very robust information technology department that talks about what you see here on the slide. The, the thing about this is that someone so where are we? Let me back up a step. We're talking about the degree that Ivy Tech gives is a two-year associate's degree. Okay, so it's a two-year program. As you go in that program, you stay in it a semester or two, you get a cert certification in a particular field, stay in a little bit longer, you get a technical certificate in that field, and then after two years, you get an associate's degree. Okay. The information technology computer science field is incredible. It has a 100% placement rate. Uh, that means the kids that come out of this program, some of them get their jobs before they're even, they even graduate. They get their certification, they're in such demand, and they start usually around $60,000 plus benefits. Uh, the demand for these students is just incredible. And uh, we're turning out quite a few of them, as many as we can. Uh, go on to the next one and we'll talk about, uh, I'll try to give you a fair warning, Susie. The other, one, the other one's health sciences. As you can imagine, we have a very high placement rate, good pay, good benefits for nursing. Um, nursing, you know, it's full. We could, I wish we had the capacity to teach more nurses. We do radiation therapy, a very technical field, respiratory therapy, and, and some of the other fields that these people get hired out of these programs. That is not a problem. So if someone's struggling for a job, think of one of these career fields, information technology, whatever it is. And what Ivy Tech will do is help them get there, help qualify them so that they can meet the requirements to get these jobs. Next slide there, we'll try that. Not to forget that we do teach the skilled trades in advanced manufacturing, many of which make more than the other fields I've just talked about. Uh, make more than many college graduates could think about earning in their first job, HVAC, welding, um, any kind of industrial technology, the automotive. We just opened a new automotive technology program because the car dealers were saying, we can't get people that know how to deal with the modern automobile, the technology of it. We've got electric vehicles coming online. You have to be highly skilled and trained to deal with those issues. And that's what we're looking at. Electricians, automation, robotics, biotechnology is a big one. Uh, we have one of the finest biotechnology training programs I think anywhere in the country, right on this campus. And that is because of Catalan, Cook, Baxter, Boston Scientific. Those people have no problem getting a job. Uh, next slide. So that's, I, I sort of specialize on some of those ones that have virtually 100% career placement. We have all these other things that people can, that anybody who has an interest in this can get a certificate or a two-year degree in. Um, and they're also very successful programs. Uh, entrepreneurship, our entrepreneurship was actually, uh, the whole course was written here in Bloomington at the Cook Center for Entrepreneurship uh, through their auspices. And it is a statewide curriculum and it is very well known for entrepreneurship. If someone wants to start a business, they're not sure what they're doing, Ivy Tech is the place to go. Next one. Okay, so in addition to the academic, take these number of classes, get these number of credits type of program that leads to an associate degree, we also do a great deal of workforce training. Now how this works is an employer has an issue. Let's say um, Cook's a great example. Early on, uh, Cook would create a new line or get a new machine or a new product, they would actually, the machine would actually be mocked up over at Ivy Tech and their employees would come over there and we would teach them how to operate this machine. 
Uh, we do a lot of training for Catalent, Cook, and other employers, no matter what it is. So we have Adam Gross can deal, uh, talk to an employer. What are your training needs? We put together the course. We can either bring them to Ivy Tech to teach them, or we can come into the employer to teach them. It could be a two-day course or a one-week course, but it's designed to skill these people up to make them better workers, you know, have a more trained, skilled worker, be more productive, and then move up the ladder, uh, get a better job at that employer. Uh, and it's highly customized. Uh, last year alone, with the pandemic even, we trained over 350 workers for a total of 14,000 hours, contact hours with these people on something to do with their employment, to skill them up and get them a better job and be more productive. Let me see the next slide. Okay, one of the most fascinating things uh, about going to Ivy Tech. So if you're in high school, you can enroll if your high school participates in dual credit courses, and many of you have children or grandchildren who have done this, and that's where you take the class in high school and not only do you get your credit towards your high school graduation, but you get credit at Ivy Tech for that class. You get college credit. There's also dual enrollment where you take a class at high school and then you go out to campus or go online and take that class at Ivy Tech. That's a slight distinction between dual credit and dual enrollment. We also have an accelerated program for recent high school graduates who uh, are up to the task. We can accelerate the two years into 11 months and that condenses it and they get their associates and are able to move on in an 11 month period. And that's been very, very successful. And then Ivy Accelerate for working adults to help them take the classes they need in the sequence they need to move quickly through the program. Um, well, we'll talk about, let's talk about dual credit for a minute. In Monroe County, we have 650 high school students currently enrolled in dual credit classes. That means in high school, when they go from one class to another in that building, they're earning college credit through Ivy Tech. And last year alone, they earned 2,724 credits. The value of that is over $400,000. Now bear in mind, they're not paying for these college credits. They are getting them free because they're in high school taking that class. So it's like getting a scholarship, okay, that allows them to be ready to go when they, when they go into any four-year public school that they're admitted to. So how that works is, and, and the best example I can give you that is, is as a campus trustee, I get to dress up in a funny outfit and attend graduation. Uh, last year at our, well, 2019, our last live graduation, I was sitting on this stage and we were handing, they were handing out diplomas, they were coming across, and across comes a group of students, I think there was a dozen of them, and they had special cords on, I asked what that was, they were high school students. They had taken enough dual credit in their high school class, they were from, I think, Green County, this group was, that they actually received their two-year associate's diploma from Ivy Tech before they walked across the stage and got their high school diploma a month later. They came out of high school basically as a junior in college. It is an incredible feat, but it saved an enormous amount of money for these people. It, it is phenomenal what they can do with dual credit. Next. So I talked to, you know, how are we doing in Monroe County? So over 2,100 people living in Monroe County are taking classes. The thing about that is that they, they usually live here. They want to stay here. They want to improve where they are right here. And so we're not doing a brain drain. Uh, they can afford to go to Ivy Tech and they're likely to stay here and enhance our economy. Uh, and it's, that's an important factor as opposed to just coming and leaving. Uh, we like the fact that they're sticky. They, they stay here once they come in. Next. So we talked about credentials. Now, if any of you work in industry or whatever, or even you know, software, um, it's all about credentials. You know, what certificate do you have? Do you 
if you have this certificate, it proves you have been trained on a certain subject. Now, it could be on a certain piece of software, because there's a ton of those. It could be on a piece of equipment, anything like that, or in a process, in a biotechnology process, that you know how to get that vaccine into that vial using these devices. And that's, that's a certificate. And there are usually two levels. There's, a, there's sort of a beginner certificate and then the advanced certificate before you get your associate's degree. So in Ivy Tech, we had over almost 500 students earn over 680 credentials last year. Now, what this means, other than the simple statistic of it, is these people have in their personnel file this certificate, which gives them a leg up in terms of pay, promotion, and benefits. And we'll talk a little bit. Many times, this is paid for. They, they didn't have to pay for these things. Their employer paid for it or the state of Indiana paid for it. So that's the first line is, is that's what I talked about stackable credits. So your first 15 credit hours in a career field will get you a certificate. The next 30 gets you the technical certificate and then 60 credit hours, you get an associate degree, okay? We also have a program called Hoosier Link. So it's tough to get in to four-year public schools. The pandemic and the dropping of the ACT and the SCT has pumped applications unbelievably. Uh, if you get into a public or any college now, you're, you're doing well because the, the number of applicants they get is staggering. So there is a group called Hoosier Link and these are students who come out and they are, this is my word, not the technical word, I'll call them conditionally admitted to Indiana University. They need a little help shining up what they did in high school. And so they come to Ivy Tech for their first year. And some of them actually live on the IU campus. Uh, and they take their first year with Ivy Tech. And because we have smaller class sizes, we are student focused on their success. They are able to get themselves up to speed and they transfer over to IU or pick another school as a sophomore and they're ready to go and succeed in college. If they take the basic credit hours on their associate's degree at Ivy Tech, they can transfer as a junior to a public four-year institution in the state of Indiana. We'll talk about the finances of that. Um, but, and there's a program called Indiana College Corps that that's the word we give for this transfer of their credits to a four-year institution. Next, Susie. So here's the economics of it. Someone gets their associate's degree in cybersecurity. They would have paid about $10,000 for that two years in tuition and fees. Now that, that assumes they're paying out of pocket. Many times you can get a grant um, or whatever, but let's say they borrowed the $10,000. They've got stackable credentials. A lot of them can get a job after one, you know, the 15 credit hours and after 30. And many of them do have part-time jobs because they're so lucrative. But anyway, so any one of these fields that you start off your, you get, for example, a digital forensics. So the next one is network penetration. The next one is network security. These are levels of cybersecurity. So you get out of that, you get a job at $60,000. It's probably higher than that right now, plus benefits. So you can pay off that student loan at $300 a month. I believe it's $300 a month in, in about a three. Yes, correct. Um, and, and you're done. You don't have the student debt the rest of your life. And particularly if you've received a scholarship from a local group or organization through a fund they set up at Ivy Tech or something like that, the cost of this is even lower. So it's very, very affordable and you can pay it off in a reasonable period of time without mortgaging your future. Next. Okay, so maybe I'll just tell you about a person I talked to uh, last week on, on Tuesday. There's a 57 year old woman uh, from Lawrence County, it happened to be, but she lost her job at the beginning of the pandemic. 
and was just going through her savings like crazy and didn't know where this was going to end. And a friend of hers told her about this program at Ivy Tech. So there, a partnership with the Indiana Commission for Higher Education, Department of Workforce Development, and Ivy Tech, that if you want to make yourself workforce ready, in other words, you want to train in one of these five fields, health and life science, well, I won't read them to you, but you can read them. They will pay for it. You pay nothing. If you qualify and your, your income, whatever all that stuff is they go through, you qualify for that. You can get trained up like this for nothing. Your credits count. You can build on that and go on and get an associate degree if you want. Uh, but this gets you workforce ready and trained and able to get a good job. And, and that's what happened to this, this uh, woman that we were talking to. 57 years old, trained in a completely different career field, has an internship uh, and a job offer after that. She's still in class, so she uh, can't work until she finishes her internship, but she's got a job. She went from unemployed to a decent paying job through this program. We tend to see a lot of people in our community who have education in a certain area and no chance they'll ever get employment in that area. What we encourage them to do is to look at these and retrain in these areas because their education is not wasted. Their, their skill sets, the, the research and writing and the, the, the commitment that they went through to get that education all apply to another career field very, very easily. And they become very desirable employees and they get to use what they've learned. So that's one of the other things that a program like this can do, but it's an incredible thing. And I think the state will continue to fund this. Next slide. Well, uh, gosh, I read through that awfully quickly, didn't I? One of the things that's going on is that the state of Indiana has estimated by 2025, we're gonna need 50,000 credentialed people a year whether it's that first or second level or associates or a degree, 50,000 a year. Right now, Ivy Tech's producing 30,000. So we have a long way to go. And the point of, so what do we need 50,000 for as well? If we're gonna sustain the economy in Indiana, we're gonna sustain a workforce that has good wages and a livable wages, we're gonna need these kind of people certified and trained. And that's what Ivy Tech, that's one of its biggest missions is right now to do that. But what I wanted to try to get across to you today is please think of Ivy Tech. Um, you know, it, they'll take a person in and they will help them. And it's very easy. You do not have to fill out reams of paperwork. You don't have to do anything like that. You can, you can call them. Uh, there's the Bloomington number, the big number. You can email them. You can go on the web and just get their foot in the door. If they get the foot in the door, the staff out there is very skillful and very trained to deal with these people where they are, that is academically or in their life. They understand how to do this and they've done a super job of it. So the real key I hope to leave you with is if you've gotten anything out of this, if you see anybody who is either thinking of not pursuing an education or has abandoned it, or doesn't know what to do, please send them our way. We may talk to them and they may end up doing something else, but that's okay. But don't let them just drift around aimlessly when there's a future available to them. Please send them to us and we'll do the best we can with them and help them succeed. So that's really kind of all I wanted to say. And thank you for patience and listening to me on this whole thing. Any questions? I'll take questions. I may not answer them, I'll take them, but. I'm... Testimony. <clears throat> can you hear me? I can hear you, Charlotte. Okay. I just want to say when I became a trustee at Indiana State in 1988, and I was a trustee there for 20, 16 years, yep. they, there was no transferring credits from, from Indiana, from uh, Ivy Tech to, to do I, Indiana State or any other 
four-year college. And that has changed totally. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm, it seems to me this is just a wonderful, wonderful development. And, and it's because of a lot of people, there was a real resistance from IU to transferring credits. And John, John Weichart actually fought the IU with that because there was a question. People at IU said, oh no, that can't, our, those credits can't be worth what they are here. And, and you know, faculty resistance and so forth. But, but we've overcome that and understand that, that, um, that that's just wonderful. So I, I'm very impressed with the whole program that's, that's there now. Congratulations. Thank you. And I, I, I appreciate that, Charlotte. And you've helped a lot in doing that. But two things. One. I did. Yes, you did. If, if for example, you go to IU and you're going to end up taking statistics or calculus and comp and everybody goes, oh, my gosh, I don't know. You can. A lot of the students at IU take those at Ivy Tech because of the small class size and the student focus of it. The, the instructor in calculus and math at Ivy Tech wants you to learn that so that you can go to IU and you can, you can perform well. Uh, so we get a lot of what we call, I think it's guest students, Susie, that come on over and they take a couple of classes at Ivy Tech and then go right back to IU. We also have, uh, as I said earlier, just a student who maybe doesn't want to know, doesn't know where they want to go to school or something. They'll come to Ivy Tech and take two years or a year, and then they'll apply to another school. So we get a lot of that because of the transferability of credit. It's made it a huge difference. Articulation. And, and they succeed. They do well. Yes. This is an entirely uh, friendly question. I spent most of the last decade out there uh, teaching at a wonderful, wonderful time. I commend the Hoosier Links program. Yes, most of those students live a, a room and board at IU and then they go out there and I never can't figure out why they didn't get into IU in the first place, but that's a wonderful um, program. I have a question though. When you mentioned faculty, you didn't mention adjuncts. And usually in most community colleges, about 60% of the uh, faculty are adjuncts. I was one. Uh, some of them, like Kyle Hetrick, go on and become full professors. But I wish you would acknowledge the uh, contribution that adjunct professors make to uh, teaching those wonderful students. Including yes. Thank you for that. It's, it's, it was on my list. I was going so darn fast, I went right past it. So Tim is absolutely right. And okay. that is one of the important things about Ivy Tech is that when we're, you're in the classroom, you are most likely to be in the classroom with somebody who is actually in the field they're teaching you. Yeah. Whether it's, it's whatever it is, math, biotechnology, engineering, whatever it is, there are a lot of adjuncts out there and they are chosen because they are good in the field they're in and you're in class with that kind of teacher. So they are critical. And I, I'm sorry I skipped over that, but Tim is absolutely right. Thank you. I, I um, have a question, and by the way, Tim, I'm so glad you mentioned Kyle Hedrick. He's one of the most extraordinary people I have ever met, and I think that any student that meets with him is really, really in a good place. Uh, Lynn, I put a very, very large uh, personal note to you in the text I'd like you to read so that we can connect, but what I just would like to say is that, you know, for women who are coming to my sister's closet who have had so many challenges and obstacles, getting them a Pell Grant, getting them connected with Ivy Tech is probably one of the better solutions that we have been able to find to be able to help them feel centered and feel like they've got support and a place with direction that helps them see their future differently. And I am just so thrilled that it is right here in our community because we refer to it constantly here. And I just am so glad that we have this program in here. Great. Thank you, Sandy. That that I really appreciate that because that's exactly what we're trying to do. Yeah. Is help these people move forward. Hey, Lynn, can I ask something briefly? Yeah. Um, okay. uh, how are you, my friend? Great. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, I have a member in my church who works for Cook, but took advantage of the Ivy Tech program yep. to um, get her a high school um, degree, and then is working on more higher education. Yep. Um, in relationship with Cook. Can you uh, discuss that program just very briefly? Absolutely. So 
Cook was one of the innovators in this, and they have the Cook My Pathways, and you can go on their website and you can find it. And what they'll do is they'll, if you don't have a high school diploma, they will hire you into a job part-time and arrange for you to get your GED. I, I believe they're giving the GED classes at Ivy Tech. They're using the facilities to do that. Once you get your GED, which they are paying for, you then become a full-time employee and you qualify for the next level of my Cook Pathways, which is they will pay for your two-year associate's degree in certain career fields. You could imagine their business and biotechnology and whatever, they have a, a list of them. But if you stay and pursue that, they're paying for that. They will also, they have an arrangement with Western Govern, Governors University that they will help you with your master's as well. So you can literally not have a high school diploma if you go to work for Cook and they will fund your education through masters and probably beyond. I don't know how far they've gone. And they have found that to be very cost effective. Um, yeah. There's also a, um, I, I wanna, don't try to get his name wrong, but I think it's Gary Stieglitz who owns the McDonald's in, I know Bedford, Mitchell, uh, I think Brown County and Martinsville. And he took something like that called Archways. And a McDonald's employee can basically, it mimics the Cook pathway through your two-year associate's degree, but they will help pay the tuition for someone to go to Ivy Tech. And, and that's a critical uh, group of employees. You think of the person at McDonald's, now when you look at them, understand they may be going to college at the same time, but this is the only way they can pay for it uh, because their employer is indeed paying for it. So there are, and a lot of people are getting on board with uh, similar programs to, that Jim talked about because they need these employees. They aren't in the workforce. How are you gonna get them? You're gonna have to train them and raise them. And this is the best way to do it. We, we take on that responsibility at Ivy Tech when they're enrolled with us to get them through the program. Uh, but a lot of employers will pay for this. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Okay, Lynn, can you stay for a few minutes after to answer any questions? Yep. Okay, great. Judy, we'll get right to you after we close the program. All right, Sally, would you tell us about next week's program? Yes, next week, which is April the 6th, we're moving to foreign policy. Stephen Lacey is a fellow in the Indiana University Russian and Eastern European Institute at the Hamilton Luger School, and he's going to be speaking about Russian strategic interests. So I have my undergrad degree in Russian and East European studies, just in it, case. You see, it's a master plan. We do this <laughs> on purpose. We will definitely have to join us next week. <laughs> All right, uh, let's have the four-way test so that we can say that together to close our program. Of the things we think, say, and do, first, second, all right, Judy Schroeder, go ahead with your question. Uh, thank you. 